everybody. I'm Derek Hayton. Um, I am a family medicine and addiction medicine. Um, I had been at the Boise VA, but actually just left about a week ago. And so I've been spending my time um, hiking and climbing the mountains for the last couple of weeks, but I came back to town to give this talk. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. Um, let me see if I can pull the slides up here. Okay, can everybody see my slides okay? All right. So today we're going to talk about the treatment of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time, you know, talking about patient selection and level of care before we get into the actual um, medications for, for treatment. You know, honestly, the, the medications to treat alcohol withdrawal are pretty straightforward. Um, I think the more complicated part is making sure that, you know, you pick the right patient for the right level of care. So we'll spend a little time talking about that. Um, and this pretty closely follows the ASAM guidelines. Um, so some of the slides are a little bit uh, verbose because I've just kind of copied their, um, their, their kind of bullet points. Um, but at any point there's any kind of you know, question or something like clarification, just speak up. Um, whenever I have my screen shared, I oftentimes can't see if you raise your hand. So just, just shout, just interrupt me if there's a question. So here's the outline. So again, we're gonna review the treatment of alcohol withdrawal with a focus on outpatient evaluation and management. We're going to follow the ASAM guidelines. We'll go over the diagnosis of alcohol withdrawal syndrome, which is pretty straightforward. Spend a little time on the level of care determination uh, and then talk about treatment options with medication. So diving right into the diagnosis of alcohol withdrawal. So this is something that's very straightforward, um, but I think sometimes we can get it wrong because we don't always take the time to really think about the formal diagnostic criteria for alcohol withdrawal. You know, someone will present, they'll kind of look like they have alcohol withdrawal. Um, and they have a history of drinking, but that sometimes, you know, you, you talk to them and they haven't had a drink in two weeks. And so you're like, oh, well, that's not it. Um, and so just taking the time to either formally or just kind of run through the mental checklist of the, the um, diagnostic criteria can be quite helpful. Um, the second thing is that uh, people will commonly come in and they'll, they'll just get a seawall right away and it will be elevated. So they'll say, ah, this is alcohol withdrawal. Um, and while you should always get a seawall scale or some other kind of, you know, objective somewhat an objective measurement of their symptoms. The CWA is not a diagnostic tool. It's very nonspecific. And so lots of things give you an, an elevated CWA. So don't use a CWA for the diagnosis. Um, and then also don't base the diagnosis on whether or not their blood alcohol is, is positive. You know, because if somebody comes in and their blood alcohol is zero, okay, they could be in withdrawal. But if it's 100, they could still be in withdrawal because maybe it's usually 300. So that is not a, a diagnostic criteria. And so if we look at the actual DSM criteria for alcohol withdrawal, you know, at your leisure, you can go back and look at it, um, but it's pretty straightforward. So in essence, they just must have been, you know, heavy and prolonged alcohol consumption. They must have either stopped or cut back dramatically. And then they have to have symptoms that are kind of characteristic of alcohol withdrawal. Um, because about 50% of people who do have heavy and prolonged alcohol use um, will never develop alcohol withdrawal symptoms in their life. All right, so then the differential diagnosis, uh, so there, are, of course, are a lot of medical um, conditions that can cause uh, a condition that looks like alcohol withdrawal, but probably for our purposes, the most important things to think about are, you know, is this patient intoxicated with something else? Um, are they withdrawing from something else? Is there no substance on board? Um, you know, oftentimes people will use multiple substances, and so you might see a patient that has alcohol use disorder, but they come in withdrawing from opioids, and so you really have to make sure that you elicit a full history from them before you to start treating the benzodiazepine. Because as you would imagine, if, if somebody also is using opioids and then you, you know, say, hey, here's some Ativan, um, bad things can happen. So we wanna make sure that we consider the differential. So in summary, you know, make sure that you know, the patient that you're treating actually has alcohol withdrawal. Don't use the CWA as the diagnostic tool. Um, don't base the diagnosis off their blood alcohol level and consider other causes of their presentation. All right, so moving on to the level of care. Um, and so when we think about level of care, I'm basically talking about roughly between uh, ambulatory versus um, like an, an inpatient or residential treatment. Um, ASAM divides ambulatory care into two levels. So level one is basically um, what, what essentially every doctor's office is gonna be. And then level two is gonna be a much more extended um, treatment facility. So the patient can come in, be evaluated, stay there for a large portion of the day, be reevaluated. And so level two is, is very uncommon, and, and I'm not aware of any uh, providers in Idaho that provide level two care, but there could be some out there. Um, so when we're thinking about the level of care determination, there are really three kind of broad categories or kind of buckets we can think about. 
So the first one is, well, how bad are their, are their symptoms right now? You know, how sick do they appear right this moment? The second is, what's the risk of developing severe withdrawal during the course of this acute withdrawal um, episode? And the third are the biopsychosocial complications. And so when we think about their current symptom severity, you know, this is when we're gonna go back and look at our CWAS score. And so once we've already decided like, yes, this is in fact alcohol withdrawal syndrome that we're dealing with, then you get a CWA. Um, there are some other instruments that are out there. I've listed two others on here. There's the brief alcohol withdrawal scale, which is kind of like a CWA, but without the um, subjective patient reported symptoms. It's more just like a vital signs and what are you seeing kind of scale. And there's also the short alcohol withdrawal scale, the SAWS, um, which is nice because it's, it's self-administered. So you can always give it to the patient and they can do it at home if you, if you want to kind of track how their symptoms are doing. So this is the short alcohol withdrawal scale. You can just um, readily available online. And this is the interpretation of your seawall. Um, different, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to interpret the seawall, but this is, this is what the, um, the ASAM guidelines talk about. And so in essence, at this point, when you're thinking about, you know, that inpatient versus outpatient management, um, all other things being equal, if their CWA score is 19 or above, they should probably go to an inpatient setting. You know, if it's in that 11 to 18 range, well, it could go either way. And so you can look for any other like risk factors to see if they, you know, need to be inpatient or outpatient treatment. And if their CWA is 10 or below, then probably, they, probably they're appropriate for um, ambulatory treatment. Uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So let's take them, do the CWA. If it's too high, send them to the ER. Uh, the second step for the level of care determination is, well, how do we decide what the risk of developing severe withdrawal or complicated withdrawal? So delirium, seizures, hallucinosis, those sorts of things. So again, there are some standardized tools that can help us. So the one that I'm most familiar with is this PAWS score, the Prediction of Alcohol Withdrawal Severity Scale. There's also the Lubeck Alcohol Withdrawal Risk Scale, which is described in the ASAM guidelines. Um, if you have somebody who knows how to do it, you could do the ASEM criteria risk assessment if you have a clinician, you know, readily available who can do that for you. Um, and then you can also look at individual risk factors that might, you know, influence you one way or the other. Uh, so the PAW score is it's very simple. Um, it basically just asks the question, has the patient had any alcohol in the last 30 days? And if they have, you just kind of check some boxes, yes or no, for the, the various questions. Um, the patient does not have to be in withdrawal to do it. It's very convenient. You have to come in and they're currently intoxicated or they've been drinking still. Um, you can still administer the PAW, the, the PAW score just to, to, to find out if they are at high risk. And high risk for the PAW score is defined as um, that they're likely to have a withdrawal that will result in a CWA greater than 15. And so really all it means is that if the CWA, excuse me, if the PAW is positive, they probably need a benzodiazepine in their treatment, which we have the medications in a little bit. That is the PAW scale, again, readily available online. Uh, the Lubeck is very similar. Um, the, the, the pause was built on kind of medically ill patients, whereas the Lubeck, the cohort uh, that, they, that they studied were not medically complicated psychiatric patients, but it's the same kind of outcome if their scores over 17 that they're a high risk for complicated withdrawal. Um, here's the ASEM criteria. I'm really not, not gonna talk about it. Um, uh, typically you need to have somebody who's, who's trained in doing the ASEM criteria if they're gonna use this. And then there are individual risk factors. So if you have somebody who you do the pause or the Lubeck on them and it comes back as a seemingly low risk, well, you wanna ask them about, well, have they had um, alcohol withdrawal, delirium or seizures, especially in the last year? Um, if you were to have somebody who otherwise appeared to be low risk, but they said, oh gosh, I was just in the ICU with delirium three months ago, that's probably somebody who should not be treated as an outpatient. You know, if they had a seizure this morning, they probably shouldn't be treated as an outpatient. Um, if they're on other GABAergic medications like benzodiazepines, or if they're on opioids, that's pretty complicated. Um, they maybe can be treated as an outpatient if you feel comfortable with it, um, but it's pretty high risk. Um, if they've got you know, autonomic instability, hypertension, tachycardia, um, you might consider a higher level of care. So the take-home points, um, yeah, use a risk ass assessment tool. It can be very helpful to guide you, you know, is this person high risk, low risk? What medications would be appropriate? Should I use a benzodiazepine? What kind of monitoring do they need? Um, if they have a history of complicated withdrawal, their risk of having another complicated withdrawal is pretty high. And so they might not be a good candidate for ambulatory. Um, and use of certain medications, again, other GABAergic medications puts them at high risk. And then lastly, the biopsychosocial complications. Um, and, and so this is gonna be, you know, what other medical problems do they have? You know, if you have a patient that comes in that has a history of atrial fibrillation that, you know, is always in the hospital with rapid ventricular rate, 
know, if they've got severe coronary disease, if they've got history of epilepsy, you know, it's going to make it uh, challenging to manage them appropriately in the outpatient setting, and you might consider doing uh, inpatient treatment. Um, if you have laboratory studies, then if, you know, they have acute kidney injury, if their electrolytes are out of whack, um, they may benefit from being treated as an inpatient if they have some active psychiatric conditions. Um, or one thing that I think we, we've, we don't think about that often is what's their social circumstance? You know, is this somebody who uh, is unhoused? Do they not have a car? Do they live alone? You know, who's going to help them through this course? Um, and again, this, this isn't like an absolute contraindication to ambulatory um, treatment, but, you know, you have to ask yourself, is it safe for this person to be going through withdrawal on a sedating medication, driving themselves to the visit, living alone? So it's just another factor to consider. So in summary, you know, the three things we want to think about are how, how severe is their current withdrawal? So you're going to look to the seawall for that. What's their risk of having a complicated withdrawal? So you look at your pause score, their withdrawal history, you know, their other comorbidities, and then what's their biopsychosocial situation? Okay, so back to the, the topic on hands. Now we're going to talk about, you know, treatment of alcohol withdrawal and medications. Now this is the part where um, the slides get a little bit wordy just because they come basically straight from the ASAM guidelines. Um, so I'm sorry about that, but you can go back and, and read them at your leisure or the guidelines if you'd like. Um, so of course, you, know, you wanna have the supportive care for everybody. So you wanna talk to the patients about what, what's to be expected. Um, you wanna recommend that they have a, a, a home environment that's not that stimulating, that they're hydrating, that they're eating, that they have somebody to keep an eye on them, maybe give them a, a vitamin. Uh, so our medication options, so benzodiazepines are going to be the mainstay of treatment. Um, increasingly, we use anti-epileptic drugs, so things like gabapentin and carbamazepine for the lower risk patients. Um, Valproate's mentioned in the guidelines, but, but it's, it's not recommended as monotherapy. They say you can add it on if needed. I have never used Val Valproate for this. Um, I don't know if anybody does. I'd be curious what their experience is, um, but there's a lot of toxicities with it, and I think there are better options. Um, I only list it there because it is... Uh, mentioned in the ASAM guidelines. And then phenobarbital, you know, we're seeing a kind of a resurgence of phenobarbital. Um, it probably should not be used in, in the outpatient setting very often. And the ASAM guidelines do recommend that, that it's not used in, in level one management, which is going to be most office-based practices. All right, so we decided that we have a patient who does have alcohol withdrawal. They're an appropriate patient for ambulatory treatment. And they have mild withdrawal and they are at low risk of complication. Well, what are our treatment options? So the guidelines are gonna say that we have the option of using benzodiazepines, carbamazepine, or gabapentin. Um, all of these are gonna be fine. Now, what's gonna make us lean one way or the other? Well, if you have somebody whose seawall is pretty low and, they, and they're at low risk of having seizure, um, increasingly we're, we're using the anti-epileptic drugs, the gabapentin and the carbamazepine. And the reason for that is that they have um, you know, less sedation, their lower risk if somebody returns to drinking. And with both of those medications in the studies where they, you know, compared um, gabapentin or carbamazepine to lorazepam, um, patients had less rebound drinking after they stopped medication. So if you had a patient that was being treated for alcohol withdrawal, and um, the patients who were treated with a benzodiazepine, as soon as the medication was stopped, they would return to drinking faster and drink more than the patients that were treated with gabapentin or, or carbamazepine. Um, so they are pretty attractive medications now for um, treatment of mild withdrawal. Um, and with gabapentin, uh, you can also continue the medication at a higher dose um, for ongoing treatment of alcohol use disorder. So that's kind of an added perk to it. So with gabapentin, again, it's efficacious both for alcohol withdrawal syndrome and alcohol use disorder. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can dose it. And so you can either do a taper, which I've you know, illustrated there for you. Um, alternatively, you can do 400 milligrams TID for three or four days and then start the taper, which is how it was done in um, one of the big studies. Um, or if you have a conversation with a patient and you think that gabapentin could be a good long-term treatment for their alcohol use disorder, you can go ahead and start them at the higher dose, which is 600 milligrams TID. And then you can just continue that for as long as it's efficacious for them. You know, if when you see them back in follow up, you know, after they're through with their acute um, withdrawal, uh, if it's helping them with their anxiety and their alcohol cravings, and they're drinking less, um, they can be a good option for their long term alcohol use disorder. Oh, and then again, I want to emphasize that gabapentin has not been shown to prevent seizures. So if somebody is at risk for seizures, they should not be on gabapentin or carbamazepine, they should be on a benzodiazepine. Um, so carbamazepine, um, again, 
in, in the studies, it seems like it's very equivalent to using gabapentin, um, less rebound drinking, it's dosed, you know, six to 800 milligrams uh, on day one, and then you go down by 200 milligrams a day until it's tapered off. Uh, most common side effect of medication is itching. Um, I have not, I, I prefer gabapentin to using carbamazepine because you can continue the gabapentin. So this is not a medication that I reach for commonly, but it is evidence-based and it's in the guidelines. So benzodiazepines, so if you have a patient that has more moderate symptoms, or let's say there's somebody who is appropriate for ambulatory treatment, but they have a higher risk of um, complication, then benzodiazepines are going to be our mainstay of treatment still. Um, as far as the efficacy, there's no real reason to prefer one over the other. You know, all of them can work okay. Um, typically, we want to use a longer acting benzodiazepine if there's not a contraindication because the longer acting agents are going to give you a smoother withdrawal course. Um, so most commonly, that's going to be something like your chlordazepoxide, alibrium, or diazepam. Um, you know, if you're worried about hepatic insufficiency, if you think someone's got, you know, some liver problems, then that's when you're going to reach for lorazepam, a short acting agent that's not, you know, hepatically metabolized. Um, the one thing, one caveat I would add is not in the guidelines is that I would recommend avoiding oxazepam if you can, you know, if that's the only um, agent that's available at your institution, that's okay. Um, but oxazepam is difficult because it is, it has a slower onset. So after you give the medication, it takes a while for it to work and it's still pretty short acting. And so it tends to be a pretty choppy course for people. Um, so that's the only benzodiazepine that I would really kind of suggest you, you try to avoid. As far as how you dose the benzodiazepines, you have a lot of options. And so probably the most common method for the outpatient setting is to do a fixed dose taper. And so I put just some examples on the left there for clodazepoxide, diazepam, and lorazepam. Um, it is possible to do a symptom-triggered dosing scheme, which is what we typically do, um, well, I say what we commonly do in the hospital. Um, so if you have, you know, a pretty savvy patient who has, you know, somebody who can, like a caregiver who's going to be with them, and they can administer either, um, you can show them how to do a CWA at home or a SAWS, and you feel good about it, then they can, they can sort of adjust their dose based on their symptoms. Um, typically for, for an ambulatory patient, I just do a fixed dose taper and see them back soon. Um, and then you can also front load, so you can give them a dose immediately um, to kind of bring their symptoms down right away. And so if you are going to front load, this is what the ASAM guidelines say about it. And so if you have somebody who's at high risk of severe withdrawal, you can give them, you know, a higher single dose um, initially. Um, and this, this is your patients who are at risk of having a severe withdrawal, they're medically or psychiatrically complicated. Um, or they mentioned if somebody is dis displaying signs or symptoms of withdrawal with a currently positive blood alcohol content. And the reason they're saying this is because that patient's going to be at risk for having a pretty bad withdrawal. Um, I, I would say the last bullet point there, uh, I would be cautious about that because if somebody's already having significant signs of withdrawal with a positive blood alcohol, um, they're going to be at pretty high risk of uh, severe withdrawal. And so that's somebody who I might consider sending to the ER to get stabilized first. And that was a, a question that always comes up with benzodiazepines is, you know, do I, do I need laboratory studies before I can start them? Because we are all taught that you know, you don't want to give somebody a long-acting um, benzodiazepine if they have hepatic insufficiency. And the short answer is yes, we want to have laboratory studies if we, if we can get them. Um, and so if possible, it's better to have your patient get laboratory studies before they come in or, or to collect them while they're in the office. Um, but the, the risk of not treating their alcohol withdrawal is, is, is greater than the risk of accidentally giving somebody a long-acting benzodiazepine without knowing their, their hepatic function. And so the guidelines state that if there's not a history of um, liver disease and there's no symptoms that would suggest they have liver disease, that if you don't have the labs, that's okay. You can go ahead and treat them with the medication that you think is appropriate. Um, if you're a little bit concerned about it, you could give them a lower dose or you could go ahead and give them you know, um, lorazepam if you think that's the appropriate medication. Um, so you don't want to, to delay treatment to wait for labs. Um, and if you're nervous about it, then you can just you know, treat them with lorazepam and that's perfectly reasonable. And then a few words on phenobarbital. Um, as I said, this is a medication that's kind of making a resurgence. So phenobarbital was the first medication that was used to treat alcohol withdrawal. Um, it was back in like the 1920s um, and it was used for decades. 
Um, but then as benzodiazepines were developed in the 60s and 70s, um, we really just stopped using phenobarbital for this indication because benzodiazepines are so much safer. Um, you know, phenobarbital has got, um, you know, a hundred hour half-life. It's, uh, it has a very narrow therapeutic index. So it's very easy to use too much phenobarbital and have somebody get pretty sedated. Um, and also because it lasts so long, if you treat somebody with phenobarbital and they go home and drink again, then they're going to be at pretty high risk of sedation. Um, and so the A7 guidelines say that really uh, you shouldn't use, you probably shouldn't use phenobarbital most of the time in an ambulatory setting, unless you have a lot of experience with it and you can monitor people very closely. So we're not going to talk about the dosing of phenobarbital. I'm not going to talk about it much at all, because I think if you're going to use phenobarbital, you need to be pretty experienced in it already. I don't want you to walk away from this talk reaching for phenobarbital. So other medications that are out there, um, you can use um, alpha-2 agonists or beta blockers. Um, I don't use these very commonly. I think they can kind of mask symptoms. But if you are treating a patient and you know they're, they're on a benzodiazepine or gabapentin or carbamazepine, and then they're having some you know, breakthrough anxiety or their heart rate's up a little bit, and you, and, and you think you know, in your clinical judgment that increasing the dose of the benzodiazepine is not going to be the answer, you know, then you could give them a little clonidine or a little, um, you know, metoprolol or propranolol, something like that. Um, typically, my thoughts on it, and again, I don't, I don't want to um, disagree with the guidelines, but, but typically my thoughts are, well, you can probably just give them, you know, more of whatever medication is treating their withdrawal. Um, but if there's, a, if there's a reason not to, then these are an option to kind of tone down some of those symptoms of autonomic hyperactivity. Um, and this is also the indication where the guidelines say that you could consider valproic acid, although I've never done that. Before I go on, are there any questions about medication so far? And I'll check back again at the end. All right, so now follow-up. So what do we do next? Um, so this is one of the more important things, and that is you, you really do want to see the patient back um, the next day if possible. Um, and so I, I think one area, one thing that is commonly done I think is a bit dangerous is that if somebody comes into the office, um, and you write them a prescription for, you know, a, a week's worth of Librium and send them out the door and kind of, you know, cross your fingers and wish, wish them luck. Um, and so the guidelines say that you, you, you should have the capability to touch base with them daily for up to five days. Now, this doesn't mean that they have to come in and see a provider every single day. You know, ideally, they might see the provider, you know, the following day, see how they're doing, maybe even on the third day. But if that's not practical, then having them come in and maybe have a nurse visit, get some vital signs, check their CWA, just make sure they're doing all right um, is better than nothing. And, you know, if, if logistically, if they just can't come in, then doing like a, you know, a telehealth call or, or a phone call or just some kind of follow-up to make sure that, you know, they're taking their medication, they're doing all right, uh, they're staying hydrated and that they're not, you know, returning use of alcohol. Uh, and I'm sorry, there's a little typo down there for blood alcohol contend. My apologies. Um, and so, you know, when, when you reduce them in follow up, these are the things you want to look for. You want to make sure there's, that they're um, not becoming agitated, that their withdrawal is not getting out of control, um, that they're not having any kind of, you know, psychiatric issues, that they're not returning to alcohol, that their vital signs look okay. And you want to make sure that they're eating and drinking and staying hydrated. And if any of these things um, aren't happening, then probably they need a higher level of care. And then what do you do if you see the patient back and they're still appropriate for outpatient management, we think, but, but their symptoms are getting worse? Well, so first things first, you know, think about increasing the dose. And so, you know, if you're treating somebody with um, kind of a high dose of gabapentin, well, okay, you probably can't go up on that. If you're using carbamazepine, that's kind of a fixed dose regimen. Um, but if you're using a benzodiazepine, you could always go up on the dose of the benzodiazepine if they're not sedated and that seems appropriate. Um, you know, you, you want to make sure that they don't need to go to the hospital. And so they came in and their CWA was 12 yesterday. Now they've been on, you know, Librium for 24 hours and their CWA is 20. Um, that should so sound some alarm bells and maybe they need to go to the ER. Um, maybe you switch their medication. So if you start on gabapentin and, and they're getting worse and not better, you can maybe, you know, add on or switch to a benzodiazepine. Um, if it's the other way, if you start them on a benzodiazepine, you could consider adding gabapentin. And then again, you could always use an alpha agonist or a beta blocker. Um, I, I, again, I don't um, because I worry that we're going to mask symptoms and get into trouble with that. But the guidelines say that is an option. All right. And there's some references. So um, I, I realized this was a kind of a pharmacology credit and I, I didn't get into the weeds about the pharmacology of the medication. Um, so if anyone has any, any uh, questions, I'm happy to 
wax poetic about the medications as much as anybody would like. Or we have a pharmacist here and they could actually say something intelligent about it. Thank you, Derek. Uh, that was a great presentation. We appreciate you doing that. Let's open it up to everyone and see what questions or thoughts we have. Hey, uh, Derek, would you uh, say a word or two about the, I think it was the fourth line down on your, your last slide having to do with benzodiazepine resistance due to kindling? Yeah, so that is something that we see. Um, and so, uh, gosh, everybody who works at the VA, I think we can think of a couple of patients in particular. So, you know, every time that, that you um, go through alcohol withdrawal, you kind of get primed to go into withdrawal faster and worse. Um, and, and the reason why this happens, and, and, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong here, is that the, um, the, the, the actual ion channel itself, the subunits change. And so as those subunits change, the particular combination of subunits that the benzodiazepine binds to, um, that combination becomes less prevalent. And so then the benzodiazepines can't bind. And so you can, you can actually have patients that um, have gone through withdrawal enough and they've had benzodiazepines enough, but they just don't work. And so you could give them all the value in the hospital and it's just not going to work. Um, and so for those patients, that's when phenobarbital is an outstanding option. Um, now that's my understanding of it. So again, if there is... Uh, somebody else here who knows differently, um, let me know. But that's that's basically what the, the ASAM textbook says about it. Derek, we had another question in the chat from Anushka Burde who said, um, which one do you prefer to pick first, benzos or gabapentin? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, so I would say I always prefer the least sedating medication that I can use. And so I think if gabapentin is appropriate, I would always use gabapentin. Um, if there's a reason why I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that gabapentin is not going to be appropriate. So if, you know, they have a history, if they're high risk for a complicated withdrawal, um, or if they come in and their CWAS score is kind of on the higher side, then, then maybe I'd reach for a benzodiazepine. Um, but yeah, if gabapentin is appropriate, uh, I would, I would try that first. Uh, again, with a caveat, if they've ever had a withdrawal seizure, I, I would treat them with a benzodiazepine, um, every time you know, after that. Even if we're not 100% sure of the history of it, if they say they've had a seizure and it might be related to alcohol, I, I would have caution, I would use a benzodiazepine. But thank you, good question. Any questions from our panelists for Derek about this topic? You know, the ones, uh, the patients that I have the, the hardest time with are the ones who present late in the week, say on a Friday. <laughs> and, you know, you don't want to miss that window of opportunity because uh, the the likelihood of them coming back, uh, you know, it's it, and you, you have a hard time. Well, I have a hard time saying, so go ahead and go drink for the next few days and then come back and see me on Monday and we can do this safer. How do you manage your end of the week uh, presentations, and you don't want to miss the window of opportunity. Oh man, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that question. That, that's that's a tricky one. Um, so I, I think it depends. And so, you know, when you get the history from the patient, um, finding out about how bad their withdrawal has been in the past, I think is very helpful. Because we have to bear in mind that, you know, uh, it, it, if it's a Friday afternoon patient who comes in and they've really never had withdrawal before, but they're just worried, well, they may not go into withdrawal at all. And so you might not do, need to do anything. If they're fairly low risk, or I feel like that, that gabapentin is reasonable, then I would go ahead and prescribe them gabapentin. Um, honestly, if they are um, a higher risk person or there's somebody that is kind of not known to me and they need a benzodiazepine, um, my inclination would be out of safety sake to, to tell them I need you to come back on Monday. I'm, I'm, I'm disinclined to give somebody on their very first visit who has a history of alcohol use, you know, a prescription for benzodiazepines for days at a time. Um, I, but it depends. I'm not saying that I haven't, but, but it depends. But because I'm, I'm sympathetic at the same time, you hate to miss them. And so um, it's, it's, it's a tricky situation. And there's not like an evidence-based or a guideline driven answer for that. I, my, my, the way that I've done it, and I'm not an addiction uh, specialist, uh, but what I've, typically done in that uh, scenario is just uh, call them uh, every day, call them on Saturday, call them on Sunday, see how they're doing, and then see them back on Monday. But but it makes me uneasy whenever I do it. 
Oh, no, I think if that's something that's that's practical for you, where you can touch base for them, I think that's great. Um, I mean, just logistically speaking, I'm usually off in the mountains on the weekends, so I'm not gonna, I, I don't call anybody on the weekends, but <laughs> but, but if, if you have the capability in your office or you're willing to do it, then I think that's, that's a very reasonable option. Okay. I'd be curious to see what Dr. Harris and Dr. Palmer think about that, about that scenario. Yeah, uh, I'll jump in here. Um, I think, can you hear me? Okay, my picture didn't pop right up immediately, so usually it does. Um, I think it's very patient dependent in that kind of a situation for whether or not they're going to be able to make it through the weekend. So if a patient shows up and they've got their spouse with them and they can kind of repeat back to me what, what the process is and they can kind of understand what what they would need to come to the ER for, um, then I'm going to be much more willing to, to say, okay, if it worsens, you either go to the ER or you have to start drinking again. Um, so if they refuse to go to the ER, but their withdrawal is getting worse, then they need to drink again. Um, and if they, if they can understand that and they have a good support system, then I'm more willing to give them a few days worth where if, if they're, here on a Friday and, and they're homeless and they don't have anyone with them and they're not taking their, their psych meds that they're supposed to be on and they can't really give a good plan of how they're going to stay sober over the weekend, um, then I'm definitely not going to give that for the weekend. So I think it's just very, very patient dependent. Um, but in those cases where I can't see people back quickly enough, um, or in cases where I think that they should be in the hospital, but they refuse to go to the hospital, then I will still try it, but I will, I will make sure that they know if you get worse, you have to go to the hospital or you have to start drinking again because it's not working in the ambulatory setting. It looks like we've got, oh, Julie, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to agree that I think if you send somebody out on a Friday, it's really important to have a good safety plan so they know what they're supposed to do should they go into more serious withdrawal, kind of from kind of that safety perspective, but also, I mean, I hate to say liability perspective of seeing somebody and then saying come back on a Monday, that could create a pretty big risk. Thanks, Julie. Um, we had a few questions in the chat and then we'll transition over to our patient case. So Lee asked, do you recommend that patients not drive during treatment given the use of sedating medications? And Kathy did respond and say, I would recommend that the patient not drive. Would you agree, Derek? Absolutely, yeah. Great. And then Anushka asked another question. Do you also start nal naltrexone at the same time while you're treating them for the withdrawal or wait until they're stable? Um, so uh, typically I wait till at least day five. And so there's some evidence that if you wait till at least day five after the last drink, they do better with it. And I think part of that's because um, now tends to be a little bit nauseous. And so you don't want to make people feel sicker. Um, and so since I'm anticipating and seeing them back for the next few days, usually I would wait until the fifth day, at least. 